You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on their second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is was just lacked that intensity. So normally Owen does this, uh, Nathan, and he explains how it works and everybody, it's very seamless. There's a lot of pressure. These are big shoes you have to fill today, especially because he's off swan around France. Well, Jer, as uh, you'll know from the performance every week, performance rankings every week, Jer, it's a slow start to this, isn't it? Uh, two in red, which means not very good. One in amber, which means yeah, a bit grand. And two in green, which means a How do we come up with the colours, Nathan? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's like some sort of traffic light system hey, or something. there you go. Miraculous. Let's start with the red then. We didn't put old Sheehan in, but we did put the messy Paris Saint-Germain project. So they're playing Leon last night. Go 1-0 down. They look for inspiration and there's not much inspiration coming. Neymar equalizes from the penalty spot. And then Mauricio Pochettino probably takes the biggest risk of his entire career. Bigger risk even than starting Harry Kane in the Champions League final. He takes Lionel Messi off with 15 minutes to go. Says, actually, I'm not going to take and use the greatest player of all time to try and win me this game. You can't do that, Lionel. I'm going to bring on Hakimi. Change my system. And lo and behold, it all works out. Amaro Icardi, still there, still there, Paris Saint-Germain, pops up, pretty much last kick of the game, 93rd minute, and wins it for Paris Saint-Germain. So he has won the battle, I guess, there with Gio Pochettino, because they won the match. But in taking Lionel Messi off, has he, he ultimately lost the war? Did he lose the war? This is the, this is the $64 million question, right? So if you're... If you're Pochettino and you're out of work and Paris Saint-Germain ring, you're taking that phone call and you're going, yeah, of course I'm going to take that job because it's one of the best jobs in world football, right? Or is it? I mean, if you look now at how well Thomas Tuchel is doing at Chelsea and you compare with the perceived failure that Tuchel had at Paris Saint-Germain to get the most out of his available resources, you begin to wonder if this is actually one of the most poisoned chalices that anybody can ever have. It's like... Is it, is it or is it a no-lose situation? Is it, though? Like, I mean, okay, so... Thomas Tuchel is at Chelsea, despite all that happened to Paris Saint-Germain. He still managed to emerge with credit in the bank. And Maurizio Pochettino has the most devastating attacking force we have ever seen in world football at his disposal, until January at least. You go, you win the Champions League. You're the guy who could somehow knit all this together. Don't. You're the next Carlo Ancelotti. You know how to get all the Galacticos working together. And that's that's you. That's you as a manager for the next 20 years. Maybe. That's assuming they win the Champions League, which is a massive if, right? Because there's, there's a possibility that this isn't actually all going to work out the way it works out in FIFA. That they don't have a midfield. That this is Manchester United. The criticism of Manchester United that everybody has is, oh, and midfield's not going to... And it's like exactly the same problem that they have at Paris Saint-Germain. And you have a, a striker who's on his way out in Mbappe, who is he really going to play to his full potential this year, given that there's the risk of injury for a team that you're not going to be with next season or until they sign a new deal, and maybe they will actually, because they've, they've said that they're intent on keeping him. So maybe they just give him two million a week and he's the first hundred million pound a year uh, soccer player, basic, netto. I don't know. But I, I don't think there's a guarantee that this is going to work. I think that we've all been shooing them into Champions League favouritism. They were the shortest, them and, and City were the shortest prices. And uh, things don't work out like that in football. Football's still a team game where you need a team and you need an ethos and you need everybody to work together. And I, Leo Messi did not look happy. It, it, I know I know you're going to say, th these are still the photographs. So there's the first one. He's like, well, what's going on, right? So That is know. the most, I've been in Paris three weeks and I now have all the Parisian... Mannerisms. Mannerisms. Yeah. It's you the just needed the fingers but it's together. It's this one where he's on the he's on the bench, and it's like everybody's watching him, and he knows the whole world is watching him, and he ain't happy. He's not I, happy because he's getting taken if off. If it wasn't two weeks in, you would look at that picture and think that's a that guy has screwed me, that guy has humiliated me. Well, this guy. I mean, he has though, right? It, it, this Sacked is by Tottenham. This is Leo Messi. Mauricio Pochettino says that he's protecting him from future injury. Little Messi is not a kid anymore. He can't play every single match. Well, he, he, I mean, you know. Okay, I'm protecting you from... I'm, I'm, I'm saving you from yourself, Nathan. You, you just can't handle this. You're not aware enough of everything. Well, then don't pick me in the game. Well, give me a rest. Don't, don't make me play this stupid game if you're not going to give me the opportunity. What I was doing was I was showing the centre-back one picture for the whole game, and in the last five minutes, when he expects me to do that, I'm going to do what I always do and skin him the opposite direction. But you... 
what, what kind of footballer were you, Pochettino? Your team's played crap football. Oh, let's push, let's press, let's press, let's press. Where's the, where's the beauty in that? Where, I'm Leo Messi. You're Mauricio Pochettino. You couldn't even manage Harry Kane. And now you're, oh, you're learning the Harry Kane lessons now, are you? Thanks very much. Well, I think if I'm Mauricio Pochettino, was well able to mar- manage Harry Kane and got the best football of Harry Kane's career out. And then he picked him in a game he wasn't fit for and lost the opportunity to have a lifetime well, maybe in the Champions League. Maybe he's learned his lesson. Well, that's what I'm maybe saying. Maybe he's learned his now lesson. Now you have. And no. he says, Lionel Messi, I'm not going to have the same thing, Lionel. I'm going to protect you the way I couldn't protect yes. Harry. So you're there and available. There's no problem with taking Messi off at 15 minutes ago, except that it's 1-1. And you're telling Lionel Messi, I don't believe that you can win us this game. It's 3-0 you take Messi off. In the final quarter of an hour. Yeah. I'm thinking that me as a coach tactically I can make a load of changes bring on a full back change system and that's going to be a better fit for Paris Saint-Germain than you the greatest player of all time. So is that what he did? He, he changed he went to a five did he? What did he do? No he brought on um, he brought on Hakimi who they also spent a lot of money for during the summer like he made a lot of changes he is resting players like Genie van Yaldum was on the bench as well so oh yeah that's the same <laughs> <laughs> well you're going on about no midfield actually and here Ander Herrera it's not a world class midfield but no. they're obviously going for a lot of energy in that midfield and Vinaldum will uh, certainly cast provide off them a gay, provide them with that cast off Ander Herrera and Liverpool freebie Genie Wijnaldum okay so it's grand right it's, it's fine. fine it's fine but it, like they can do a job and they will do a job in most games but I, I don't who else can it... do a job Leo Messi can do a job in the last 15 minutes against Leon I don't at home. see a downside for Pochettino that this is some poison chalice because he will never have a better chance of winning the Champions League and yes it'll all come down and that's the way of the Paris Saint-Germain job that even if he wins the league no one will give him any credit for winning the league because okay. they I, have to win it but I, if they don't win the Champions League he'll probably get fired nobody's going to turn down the gig I understand that nobody's going to turn down the opportunity because you, you think that you're going to be the one who's going to be able to do it what I'm saying is that so far the jury is out this was supposed to be a swashbuckling team that was going to slash and burn its way across the mediocre defences of European football but it turns out that Leon are able to frustrate them and thwart them for 93 minutes and that they've already struggled in the league and that they haven't looked amazing so far. Well, in the Champions, Champions League. League as well on, on Wednesday night against Club Brugge, it was a very, very dour game and Messi was peripheral. Like I couldn't believe watching 15, 20 minute spells where he was stuck out in the right wing and they couldn't get him the ball, they couldn't get him involved in the game, just looked a little bit frustrated. So it, it's very early days. They haven't had much time together. He was away in international duty. There's matches every three days. They obviously haven't come up with a system as of yet that works. Now, do you think you'd maybe like say, how do you, what do you want to do here, Lionel? What 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 works for you? You tell us what works for you, and we're gonna like craft what you need around you. Because Neymar is happy to subjugate his ego. It turns out for this one player in the world, maybe Mbappe is not. Maybe Mbappe is like, I'm the big dog. He's been the big dog since he was 18, he's 22. He's the one who's got the World Cup. Oh, do you like this? Do you like this little medal, <laughs> Leo? Look, I got a World Cup winner's medal. I, 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 you, you think that's happening? I, I, I would I, like to see that happen. It's, it's, it's been a slow burner. Everybody thought Messi would come in and this, they yeah. would win 7-0 every match. And Harlem Globetrotters football and this will be the greatest thing we've ever seen. We might even find them likeable despite the way they've gone about everything. That because the football is so good, we'd sort of give them a pass. But... It's been dull yeah. so far. And those expensive tickets, people don't want dull. Of a Sunday night in Paris. I wonder how much they were. Do we find out? You could be going to the Moulin Rouge. Uh, I mean, not if you are. Not if you don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> Did you go to the Moulin Rouge? No, Moulin I've Paris? never been to the Moulin Rouge. No. no. Did you? No, no. I, I do remember somebody offered us... Uh, to bring us to the Moulin Rouge and we were all set to go. They said, oh, we give you the full backstage tour, everything. And then they were like, that's 150 quid. Like, oh, I thought when you offered to bring us to the Moulin Rouge, uh, like it was some sort of a freebie we were getting. So, so you're getting a once in a lifetime um, experience for 150 quid and you're... You didn't we went to the, what was the pub next door? We did the show from uh, on the eve, <laughs> the, the Shamrock Bar was it? Just went there instead for the night and that was also in many ways a once in a lifetime experience. Radio really happened was you rang home and said, I'm going to the Moulin Rouge and you're yeah. told, no, Don't you're come not. home. You're not. You're, you're definitely not. Uh, tickets, because uh, I've looked at tickets for Paris Saint-Germain because my kids now obviously are massive Paris Saint-Germain fans uh, and they range from anywhere from 60 quid for not a great seat, even though the Parc de France is quite a small stadium, so it's not like being in the Stade de France and you're a million miles away. Uh, uh, how much? So 60 from, to... From 60 to anywhere up to 
several hundred depending on what type of ticket you want. How much do you think it is to go to the Lion King when it's not a school day? The Lion King, is this on in the Borgosh Energy Theatre? It is, yeah. Um, How much do you think that is? The Lion King, and so at a weekend of it, it, like, so you're thinking I'll bring my wife down for a romantic no, Friday night. No, the, the, you're going to bring the kids. I mean, that's the whole point. It's, it's, a, it's a children's Isn't movie. Isn't I been to see it? I've been to see the musical. The musical is, I suppose it is, a children's musical. Is it not? Yeah, it is. I just, yeah. It's just a waste of money on kids. I would say you're looking at 100 quid a ticket. I mean, essentially, it's 80, 80 quid a ticket. Right. Family fives 400 quid. Well, I mean, I we could, we could go to Paris and see Paris. I believe, it, yeah, I believe it a child or two at home. Oh, yeah. Well, and did you buy them? I mean, look. Ah, oh, sucker. You do what you're told, right? Absolute sucker. You're, you're given one job, you're like, if I do this. Just now, take them out of school for a day, get them on the cheap. Well, that's the right thing to do, it turns out. If there's anybody who, uh, yeah. Because, I mean, obviously. Anyway, look. Latent after uh, your. But it turns out we could have gone to Paris and watched Paris Saint for the same bloody price. Yeah. However, you might have had the own cheating experience. Well, you know, you, you're one of the million people holding up your phone and going, I was there when the first fractures in the relationship between Leo Messi and Pochettino. So Pochettino, all joking aside, right, is, is this a very straightforward thing where you take off the world's most famous, most expensive, richest player in a match when it's one all? Do you think Leo Messi it has not been humiliated by this? Pochettino saying I'm protecting from himself, that's nonsense. All the stats... <sighs> His sports bra was beep, 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 beep. Oh, he's going to get injured. I think the photos probably don't do Pochettino any favours. I expect that we will get, in uh, Lionel Messi fashion, the um, lip reader at some stage as to what the conversation was. Maybe he was asking, what's going on? Why isn't the clicking? What, where are the areas, Lionel? I need, your, I need your expertise. Give me some advice. The way Cristiano does with Ole. The way, stand here beside me. Help bellow instructions the way Cristiano does with Ole. Please do that with me. And uh, Messi's like, nah, you're grand, thanks. Yeah, I don't think... Uh, the, the, like, early signs, not great. That's all I'm saying. This is our overreaction Monday. Early signs are not good. I'm not, you can't, but Lionel Messi is going to score 25, 30 goals this season, you'd have to imagine, still. Yeah, is he going to Is he gonna be totally motivated? Is, is this tough love that he needs at this stage of his career where he's won absolutely everything? Uh, he's got a lot of games. He's got to rest them up. Get him fit for the Don't big matches. Start him in the game then. Got Say, Manchester City coming up in a few weeks. Tell him I'm going to rest you or you're going to play City a half here up and a half weeks. there. Yeah, it's the fact that it's one all, 15 minutes left and you're deciding actually there's a better option right here than Lionel Messi. Yeah. And it's like, it's not Neymar who I've benched. It's, I'm, I'm, I am humiliating him. I think, I just think it's going to be very interesting. Speaking of Pochettino, let's move on to number four here, Harry Kane. How is Harry Kane getting on? At the moment, Nathan. What's the story? He's in the red this week. Why is he in the red? Uh, well, no goal so far this season for Harry Kane and uh, barely even any attempts. Getting hammered after the match yesterday for really his lack of effort. He was completely out of the game yesterday. He was dropping deep, which we've seen him be so effective with over the last season and his link-up play with Youngman's son. But then he didn't seem to be able to get back into position when Spurs were on the attack. They played quite well in the first half, Tottenham. They... Seemed to confuse Chelsea uh, with their tactics. They had chances, half chances, sort of chances actually in games like that. you got to take. And then in the second half, he never got a touch of the ball in that second half and couldn't have any influence on the match whatsoever. And he sort of thought when the Manchester City thing didn't happen, like the two options for Harry Kane during the summer were go, sign for Manchester City, win everything, win leagues, win Champions Leagues, or stay at Tottenham and get your statue outside the stadium and probably be guaranteed 20, 25 goals a season because you're going to play every single match. You're not going to be hauled off like the superstars are at the big clubs with 15 minutes to go when the match is 1-1. You're going to play every minute of every single game and you can catch Alan Shearer's record, which we know isn't actually the record because Jimmy Greaves holds the record. But that maybe people will talk about you the way they do about Jimmy Greaves at uh, Tottenham. And actually, none of that has happened. He's come in, he looks a little bit disillusioned and this could be the worst case scenario for Tottenham that... They've kept Harry Kane, but Harry Kane's attitude is all off. Harry Kane's attitude stinks. And maybe he's not the professional that everybody says Harry Kane most certainly is, that he'll just buckle down, he'll you know, work hard, be there for the team, be the captain, the leader, the legend that Spurs need, but haven't seen any of it so far. You got the impression that if he was going to go to City, he was going to have to hit the ground running to justify whatever amount of money that was spent on him. But he doesn't look like somebody who has come back having put in a massive shift over the summer to make sure that he's in the peak physical condition. 
And the other side of this, right, always the talk around Daniel Levy is what a brilliant businessman he is. He always plays hardball. He knows exactly what he wants. He never sells anybody. But when you look back on it, like, that's based on getting as much money as he possibly could for a few central midfielders a long time ago and then Gareth Bale, which is also quite a long time ago. He missed the opportunity to sell Dali, Dali Alley for a lot of money at one point. And so uh, Dali Alley's back in the team. I'm not sure how long that's going to last. But now he's missed the opportunity to sell Harry Kane for a massive amount of money to cash in at the absolute peak of the cycle. Is, is not wanting to sell always the right thing? I mean, John Duggan called it as a Spurs fan. He wanted... They, what, he wanted to get the money in, get the rebuild going and see what happened. And, and actually, since they since he's come back in the team, have they won a game? Uh, I don't think since he started. Obviously, they uh, played very well the first three matches of the season. I think he started third game of the Did season. He? Okay. Uh, but like, maybe they were telling the truth all along for those first couple of matches that he wasn't fit. That he had taken more time uh, on his holidays than anybody else. Remember, every single other member of the England squad was available for the first those two matches uh, and Harry Kane wasn't. So maybe he thought, I'm going to let off some steam, I'm going to have a proper old holiday here and isn't in the best physical condition uh, just yet. Like, Harry Kane has always, always scored goals and you have to assume that this is going to come right. But he's also playing under a different manager who plays a very different way and watching Spurs over, well, really watching Spurs since the start of the season, even on the opening day when they beat Manchester City, it did look like a... Nuno side like very patient at times very set system of what they're trying to do uh, Wolves didn't score a huge amount of goals they were very reliant on Raul Jimenez to score the goals and Harry Kane's obviously several steps up on Raul Jimenez but not creating any chances for him and the, you see we, we assume so much of Harry Kane because he's the England captain and all that we read about his character non-stop like, yeah but and I know it's been thrown out lots but if this was a different player of a different nationality who was acting like this we would be assuming that it's a complete lack of professionalism oh yeah so he'd be Luis Suarez if Luis Suarez had done this which he could easily have done right at one stage or another he probably has done in his career he'd be like evil personified and well Luis Suarez remember stayed for that extra season on the guarantee that he could leave at Liverpool and it doesn't seem that that's the kind of deal that Harry Kane has. Luis Suarez got that deal and went on to produce one of the great Premier League attacking seasons. Harry Kane, it does seem, is there under duress. Uh, obviously, behind the scenes, it seemed to be incredibly badly managed in that Tottenham went to him with a new contract offer. He was so gung-ho and I'm definitely going to Manchester City. I don't want to talk about your contract offer. Then, City move doesn't happen. Comes back and says, give me 400 grand a week. And Tottenham are like, nah, we're done. We have you under contract for another three years. So, his head obviously isn't in a particularly good place. He's put himself out there. He has... I wouldn't say he's humiliated himself in front of the Spurs supporters, but he has like, told the Tottenham fans, I want out of here. Yeah. They're paying again. He's humiliated Bringing it all down fans. to ticket prices these days. People are paying a lot of money to go to that Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Yeah, he, he, the Spurs fans have been humiliated. I don't think, uh, ultimately, Harry Kane doesn't really care because he's going to be all right. Things things worked out. He won a genetic lottery. Um, whatever whatever that Irish blood is that he has, uh, has is serving him in good stead. Um, I'm I'm trying to find the there's no there's no there's no think piece criticizing Harry Kane in the papers in the English papers. I'm like, what what's going on? Well, Keenan Sunes went to town on him uh, after the game last night for his lack of effort, lack of impact. I think he's lucky that um, the the timing of the game yesterday has coincided with uh, the passing of Jimmy Greaves because all of the papers in England are uh, full of Jimmy Greaves uh, recollections and stuff as well. So, um, okay. We we can we can come back to that. There's there's going to be plenty of time for us to give out about Harry Kane. The one thing I would say is that he's always been very streaky. And there's been streaks where his form has been bad and he no goals, no goals. Well, no he used goals. to score in August. Remember, he never scored in August for oh, yeah. years and years and years. Yeah, then so he started is, scoring in August. Well, this is this is his new August because obviously he was back a little bit late. The other thing is that there's a World Cup on the horizon. It's a year, essentially a year away. This time next year, everybody will be like, "Oh, who's in your World Cup squad?" You know, and everybody has to be in form. And obviously, he's going to be in the squad if he's fit, but. Well, no, the, prize, the, the prize on offer for Harry Kane in 18 months is your Jimmy Greaves and Bobby Moore rolled into one. Yeah. Like, you're captaining England to win the World Cup. Yeah. Like, that's, that's as big as it gets. Get it together, Harry Kane. There is your statue. Amber Jair, sort of in between, I'm told, is what Meh. the amber is. <laughs> next week, we're hoping this will be green. They'll definitely be back in the power rankings next week, performance rankings next week. Will they be green or will they be red? Your performance is uh, a little less powerful. A little too powerful. A little too powerful. Uh, it's the Irish rugby team. 
So they got the job done yesterday, obviously under massive pressure, all the fallout that came with the game and the defeat against Spain, everything that's been going on off the pitch. It doesn't feel as though it's in a particularly good place right now. They're up against Italy, who Fiona Coughlin called earlier in the week, are very inconsistent. They can go and beat some of the best teams in the world, and then a week later, uh, just don't turn up. But Ireland beat Italy yesterday, 15-7 in Parma. Uh, Bevin Parsons absolute superstar you talk about that Galway blood even though you know she's Tom Parsons cousin so we should kind of claim her as uh, Mayo seven tries in 13 internationals it means that Ireland still have a chance of qualifying automatically next Saturday is going to be interesting so Ireland beat Italy 15-7 Scotland were 27-22 winners against Spain so this is a four team tournament quadrangular our favourite so every team has five points and points difference is now all that separates the sides. Ooh. Italy plus 17. Ireland plus 7. Spain minus 4. Scotland minus 20. So if the teams finish level in the table at the end of the final game, as a result between those teams counts first. Which means if Ireland win and Italy win next week, Ireland would qualify. So the team that finished first qualifies automatically we play Scotland for the World week. Cup. Ireland plays Scotland next week. I said results have been really inconsistent because Italy hammered. Um, Scotland in the first match and then Scotland managed to beat Spain who beat us who beat us so it's been a bit all over the shop so far we'll beat Scotland though right so let's let's do what we always do here we'll beat Scotland yeah. Scotland are chumps <laughs> there's the quote uh, yes Ireland with the confidence of that should really go and beat Scotland so if they win uh, their group they will qualify automatically for the World Cup if they come second they go into a final global qualifier and the expectation is that whoever the European team is will we'll win that quite comfortably. Okay, so... So if Ireland win... Just win next week and... They, one way or another, you would expect that they will qualify for a World Cup, which is a far, far better uh, position than they were in, obviously, this day last week. There was a lot of pressure on them because they had to perform if the results on the pitch continued to match the conditions off the field in the Interpros, then the stink around Irish women's rugby was something that the IRFU were going to find very difficult to wash away. But the results are obviously ultimately the thing that um, they can point to and say, oh, look, we're, we're progressing here. So, Well, they, like the, it was just a sensational performance in some ways as well. Uh, the Kira Griffin tackle to deny the Italians going over for a try where she's just about to pounce, she grabs the jersey and swings her around. Uh, was a key moment in the game and Baby and Parsons for the second try. She must have skinned about 12 players in that. So there's a bit of form there now at least that they can bring into the match next week. So hopefully in the performance rankings next Monday, Own Sheehan will be back. It'll be a professional event and they'll be in green. Dig out the uh, Saturday panel. Gavin Cummins gave lots of very interesting stuff to say about the uh, women's rugby team and the treatment of the women's game by the IRFU. You can get that on the OTV Sports app. Number two is the Ryder Cup. We're almost there. Team Europe, our boys, Team Europe, fly out today. Uh, they should be just getting on the plane around about now, heading towards Wisconsin, whistling straight, ahead of Friday's start for the Ryder Cup. Uh, the build-up is always interesting. It's going to be particularly interesting, I think, over the next few days with every player sits down for a press conference. Hmm, what will they be asking all the Americans about, I wonder? Why Brooks do all hate each other? and Bryson are going to dominate. So the Americans don't all hate each other. And it, it's... The Ryder Cup's a strange event. I absolutely love the Ryder Cup. Cannot wait for one o'clock Friday when the foursomes tee off. It's as good an event for anyone who's been there. It is several steps above anything else in golf. So you've got like an Irish Open and then you go to an Open and it's 20 times bigger. And then you go to a Ryder Cup and it's 20 times bigger again. Like at the Golf National three years ago, five o'clock in the morning, there's about 30,000 people at the first tee. Everybody ready. Everybody making noise. And that sort of pressure is unlike anything else you ever see in golf. I remember Glen Eagles in the fog, bright and early, first tee, Webb Simpson. Let's say he hit it 150 yards off right. the tee. Bubba Watson, like, don't you laugh at him. I think it was Justin Rose had a bit of a snigger when he oh, hit his tee shot. Did he? And Bubba turns around and says, don't you laugh at him. Wow. Like, that is the level of pressure that is there. It's unlike anything these players Who won that game? Uh, experience. I um, presume that the Europeans won that match uh, in the end. But uh, poor old Webb, thought he was going to get in this time. I suspect uh, when Steve Stricker was thinking about his wild cards and Webb was right in the running, maybe that was uh, wow. the centre on his mind. So, yeah, the Americans, a lot of it will focus on Brooks and Bryson and the fact there's a team, they're never able to come together. Aside from those two, actually, it seems like a real team, a real group of men who can gel quite well together, who are a young, emerging group. Like, on paper, this is the best American team there's ever been. 
every single one of them is in the top 21 in the world rankings. Is that the first time that's happened? That is as strong world rankings wise as America have ever been. Okay. Now, Europe do have the world number one in John Ram, but you go through that American side and it's just big name after big name after big name. Like Colin Markawa, DJ, Bryson DeChambeau, Kepka, Thomas Cantley. You're going through the morning foursomes on the Friday and you're wondering, who do you even leave out for the American side? Whereas you compare it to the Europeans, it's a vastly experienced European side. So Lee Westwood is playing in his 11th Ryder Cup, equaling the record. He probably have played more matches than anyone else by the end of this. Sergio Garcia's 10th is the record point scorer. So it's two very, it's sort of a clash of cultures here and which do you want? And in a Ryder Cup, actually, maybe experience stands for as much. But at some point, there'll be they'll be washed up versus what they were at their peak. And you don't want to be the coach or the manager or the person who's picking the team. And it's like you're picking the outlads on the basis of their reputation. Well, he's not even doing that. And we had Potter Carrington on Golf Weekly last week and you know he's talking about the Justin Rose selection and he, he said he didn't hear much controversy about it. I didn't see much controversy about it. And in fact, there was little or no controversy. And he, he can't say it publicly, but he must have been disappointed that nobody made a run on this. Like, there's no... 2010, Eduardo Molinari wins the final tournament in Scotland before the Ryder Cup at Glen Eagles, having already won the Scottish Open, even though he's a rookie, really has no choice but to pick Eduardo Molinari. Nobody has done that. Now, COVID has played a big part in that, and the lack of money in some of the events makes it hard for those players to come through to earn enough ranking points okay. to put a little bit of pressure on. And again, that affects probably the world rankings of the two teams as well. But Shane Lowry's had a good season, you know, hasn't had a win, so didn't take it out of Harrington's hands completely. But still, nobody was saying, well, you know, why is he picking the rookie ahead of Justin Rose? Because Justin Rose has done very little. But you look at the PGA Tour this year in 2021, which is where everybody is playing, mm -hmm. pretty much everyone in this team with the exception of Wiesberger. Like three Europeans have won in the PGA Tour all year. Seamus Power, who you know, wasn't really in the reckoning, John Ram, and Rory McIlroy. The Americans have 14 wins, and they've Xander Schauffele, who won the... Olympic gold medal as Bill well. Nicholson. So, like, they have... They have an absolutely star, star-studded team and they have a lot of players who look like they'd be very comfortable playing together. Harrington said he has a theme for the week. He wouldn't tell us what it is. and But from reading between the lines, listening to him, like, it is that underdog status that everything is going to be about. We are being written off by absolutely everybody. Like, this will be a big achievement they for Harrington. They said we couldn't. They said we shouldn't. Uh, so America 15 to 8 on to lift the trophy and Europe 11 to 8 to lift the trophy 15 to 8 to win it 11 to win the tie yeah, good chance of a tie no? yeah like Europe won convincingly last time out in America like 14 all it's probably the best out of all of those I, like I do find it hard to make a strong case for Europe I'd say Ryder Cup is it's a bit like the Lions in a way in that like on the Monday or Tuesday after is it going to affect your mood whether Europe won or lost what you kind of want is the drama we're asking this question on Golf Weekly of would you prefer Europe to win 18-10 or 19-9 or the USA to win with the final putt on the final green and all the drama that would go with that on the Sunday and I think it was sort of split of like people want the Sunday singles yeah you, obviously a couple from, of hours where anything could happen but every so often you would like to just Pummel the Yanks. Well, they just pummeled the Yanks last time out. So, uh, but, but not in America. They've never done in America, on. have they? Yeah, not massive pummelings. No, obviously there was uh, the Miracle in Medina, which was a singles final day pummeling of the Americans. But uh, Europe have been very dominant. Uh, it's going to be uh, interesting to see who he goes out first. I think John Ram will be first out in the foursomes. He feels like the sort of spiritual leader of this side. Yeah, I think Rory wanted to be that person, but well, it didn't. <clears throat> 2016, you remember that match? Like probably the modern, I say modern, like the last 20 years of the Ryder Cup, the best moment was probably Rory, Patrick Reed, singles match. Like the eighth green, Rory holds a 60-footer. You might remember he's giving it the ears to the crowd. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. And then Patrick Reed rolls in like a 30-footer and is pointing at McElroy. And now in the spirit of golf, they hug each other going off. But McElroy, for three or four holes, is like as intense and emotional as you've ever seen him. Now, he loses the match is the problem. But then at the last Ryder Cup in Paris, it really felt McIlroy was talking before, you know, I want to be the leader. I, you know, I'm the best player in the squad. I want to be the leader. And they put him out with Torbjorn Olsen, who's a rookie. 
I remember following them around that morning and they played terrible golf. Right. They stunk the joint out to the extent where you were going, like, Sticking out Sergio, going to struggle right? to pick Rory for the afternoon. Right. McElroy was so off form, it seemed, but they stuck him with Poulter. Right. And suddenly Poulter was the one who was able to tap into the emotion yeah. and Rory fed off that, but he couldn't Do it transfer on, on it for Olsen. So That's interesting, I, it'll it? be interesting to see yeah. how Harrington approaches that. And actually, I wouldn't be surprised if he put him out with Poulter or Garcia. Larry? I don't think he'd play a Larry. Now, he certainly, again, maybe it's a bit of mind games. He Larry was, and Ram? Larry's not going to get... Yeah, I think maybe Larry and Westwood. Okay. Well, look, we've got three days to speculate yeah. about that. So, because we, we're out of time here. Tuchel uh, is in the green. Um, ever since Chelsea have got the new sponsor with a number on their shirt, that seems to be the reason that uh, they're winning games 3-0 every, as a routine. It's like a perfect kind of little bit of branding for them. That's poor, poor. Uh, remarkable turn of events. Themselves and Liverpool have had the exact same results every week of the season so far. Really? So Chelsea are top of the league on... Because alphabetical order. Right. So exact same goal scored, goals conceded. And obviously when they played each other, they had a draw. Yeah. And they've won the other games. So uh, yeah, the exact same results so far. They are inseparable uh, right now. Yeah, uh, like Chelsea have a brilliant squad. Well, we'll get to this because uh, David Myler's standing by. So there's no need for us to do too much more about this. But Chelsea are in the green. We could have put Liverpool in the green. We could have, but I think you put Tuchel in because like Tottenham had done really well in the first half with the system that Nuno had implemented. They changed things. They brought in La Celso and the Bele. Chelsea didn't seem quite ready for that. And then he reacts at halftime, you know, brings on N'Golo Kante for Mason Mount. Mason Mount have been brilliant for the first few weeks of the season. But like, you're bringing on the best midfielder in the world, N'Golo Kante. Again, not bad. You can, you can give too much credit at times, but I think the way he turned it around, they demolished Spurs in the second half. If you want to uh, win that Gillette starter pack, tell us who should be in what colour, red, amber or green. Get it to us by whatever means necessary before the end of the show and we will announce a winner. Uh, that is this week's performance rankings. David Myler is next. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette.